group proposal. So, yep. All right, let's get started then. Yeah. So, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Um, uh, so, the agenda for today is um, just a re brief reminder I'll, I'll cover now that uh, we are not meeting next week uh, on the 9th because many of us will be in Singapore and um and so we're canceling that that meeting um uh just a reminder again of the lisbon hack fest i don't think there's any update on this i'll just cover this now to uh, so we don't spend any time uh, but the registration and agenda links are up for the lisbon hack fest on december 5th and 6th please register and um add items to the agenda and again um keep in mind that we're Again, we're sort of continuing the um, uh, continuing the the trend toward less yakking and more hacking, um, and so um, uh, ideas about how we can, you know, get started on various platforms or you know using some of the new tools, um, uh, and or you know ideas about how some of the projects can cross pollinate would be the best for that. So this morning we have two project reports because we deferred Sawtooth last week. So Kelly will give us an update on Sawtooth and uh, Nikolai, I believe, is on for Iroha. And um, uh, and then we'll have uh, a final review of the how to help uh, of the training and education working group, and then we'll put that to a vote. If we don't have quorum, we'll put that to email. And then uh, if we have time, uh, we can revisit Hyperledger Cicero. Dan has updated the proposal and um, uh, sent a note out uh, early this morning. Uh, and so we can take another another look at that. Any other items for the agenda, if we have uh, time, but if there's anything pressing? Okay, then I suggest we get started. So Kelly, if you're ready. Yeah, sure, can you all hear me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, so Tom just posted a link to the uh, updates in the chat. So for those that want to follow along, feel free to click on that. Um, but Sawtooth had a, uh, has had a pretty uh, successful period over the, the past couple of quarters. Uh, we've really been focusing on two main items, which have been uh, making Sawtooth easier to use out of the box with some sample applications and support for Ethereum. Uh, and then the second item is really focusing on API and platform stability. Uh, so most recently, we tagged a 0.89 release, which is our stable release for Sawtooth. And right now, the master branch is tagged as 0.9, uh, which is where we'll be refining the APIs ahead of our 1.0 release. One of the things that we've done to uh, help on the stability side of things is that we've kicked off long-running networks. Uh, so we have three, uh, or actually four different long-running network environments. Uh, we have three that run for a fixed uh, defined amount of period, uh, one day, seven day, and 30 day. And then we have something that we call long running network zero, uh, which is basically our continuing uh, continuous long running network where we will uh, actually manually intervene if, if we have some issues. Uh, and that's really meant to uh, help us evaluate how this can be used in production and how nodes and smart contracts and participates uh, can be updated on the fly. Uh, we have seen uh, an increase in contributors from both uh, some of the pre-existing companies that have been contributing, uh, as well as new independent contributors. And uh, there's been a pretty uh, significant amount of features that have been added over the past quarter. I think the first one, which was talked uh, about at the last hackathon, is what we call Ceph, which is the ability to run Ethereum smart contracts on top of Hyperledger Sawtooth. Uh, the most recent progress there is that we have expanded to be JSON RPC compatible uh, with the existing Ethereum implementations, which means that many of the uh, existing interfaces for Ethereum can be mimicked uh, on the Sawtooth ledger as well. Uh, we are moving forward uh, to continue that uh, integration by making it compatible with a lot of the existing tool chain. Uh, so some of the IDEs like Truffle or Remix uh, are our ne next focus for compatibility. We've also created a new repository called uh, Sawtooth Supply Chain, 
which includes uh, a smart contract uh, as well as a graphical user interface. We'll have this uh, able to be launched as Docker uh, and also has been submitted to Amazon to make easy one-click deploys. On the performance side, uh, we have uh, just declared um, sort of stability for what we call the parallel scheduler. And what the parallel scheduler does is it enables uh, smart contracts that have no dependencies on each other to be executed in parallel. And we've seen some, uh, some pretty significant improvements on the performance side versus the serial execution engine uh, that was uh, previously the, the standard in Sawtooth. Uh, another uh, more experimental feature that we've been working with is what we call unpluggable consensus. Uh, and because Sawtooth has the, uh, all of the sort of settings for the ledger stored on chain, we're actually able to submit transactions to switch from one consensus mechanism to another. And so this gives you the ability to uh, either sort of start out in a development mode and move towards a, a more production worthy consensus mechanism, uh, or in the event that there are issues in the network to roll back into a, uh, a more uh, development and managed style system. Uh, just a couple of other um, new features that I'll, I'll talk about briefly. Uh, we do support uh, a new concept called events and receipts. Uh, this is essentially a WebSocket connection that enables you to export uh, state information as it is updated uh, to a traditional database or to clients uh, to provide them with information about the success or failure of their transaction. Uh, and we also have uh, basically just finished out all of the permissioning that's going to be required for 1.0. And this includes things like uh, REST API permissioning, uh, the, the interconnect between the validators um, and also some of the smart contract uh, permissioning. Uh, and then final items, uh, Sawtooth is now available uh, in its vanilla version in the Amazon marketplace, and we have expanded our Docker options to make it easier to launch uh, Sawtooth for development purposes. Um, so as I said before, uh, right now JIRA is being actively maintained the items that we're most focused on are 1.0, which is primarily making sure APIs are stable and the platform is stable, uh, and that we continue to uh, make Sawtooth more product-like in that uh, we have a sort of uh, an out-of-the-box experience for many of the use cases. There were uh, a four different, uh, four new maintainers that were added over the uh, since the last update. Uh, we have Flying Tiger, Darian Plum, Ryan Banks, and Ann Chinette. Uh, and we've continued to see uh, good development on the contributor diversity. So that is the items that I had uh, for Hyperledger Sawtooth project update, uh, but happy to answer any questions if there are any. <clears throat> any um, questions, comments? For Hi, that's Nicolas speaking. So I've got a question about unpluggable consensus. I'm really curious about this feature. So you mean that it is possible to change consensus after Genesis block, uh, uh, after you declared your consensus in, in Genesis block? Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, we store a variety of the uh, blockchain network settings um, actually as part of the state of the blockchain. And one of those settings is the consensus mechanism. Uh, so in the Genesis block, there is a consensus mechanism that is set. Um, and then what you're able to do uh, is actually submit to our setting smart contract a transaction that proposes a change. Uh, and if that change you know, meets the smart contract validation, then that setting will change and all validators will then uh, revert to using whatever con new consensus was specified. Thank you. Uh, I do see that uh, there there was a question from Vipin in the chat about any work uh, plan for privacy. Uh, absolutely, privacy is a ongoing uh, uh, research and development area for us. Uh, the the research on privacy is really taking. Uh, uh, sort of three separate paths uh, as we as we look at the trade-offs between each of those. Uh, the first one is the the sort of separation of concerns model, 
uh, where only the you know transactions are sent to the appropriate uh, parties uh, with with a model similar to the the GSL style. Uh, we've also uh, been investigating the use of trusted hardware uh, as a as one method, and then we are doing some um, some early research into uh, some of the cryptographic techniques like zero knowledge proofs. So, Kelly, just um, I'm curious on the um, on the diversity of contributions. Can you can you characterize, you know, what, where where we are in terms of, you know, how much is Intel versus everybody else, um, either from a contributor perspective or a contributions perspective? I'm just curious to understand how it's evolving. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so I don't have uh, any numbers uh, here, but I would say that you know uh, Intel and Bitwise make up um, probably the the majority of contributors. Uh, what we've seen is we've had uh, some interaction with a number of startups that are starting to build on top of the uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth uh, platform, and they've uh, a number of these startups, while not listed here, uh, do have contributions to make, and so we're trying to work through the process. Uh, with those folks to kind of get those um, additions and, and modifications they've made cleaned up to meet uh, sort of all of the the processes that we have within um, within the Sawtooth repository. So uh, I would say that you know it, it remains uh, sort of two companies that are are uh, responsible. But we recently had Red Hat uh, create a set of four transaction processors. Uh, or I'm sorry, Wind River uh, create a, a set of transaction processors that have been open source for supply chain bill of materials tracking. Uh, and there's some current work with a uh, uh, some telecom companies who will be open sourcing uh, some uh, transaction processors as well. Thanks. And then I did see that that Hart had asked a question about uh, zero knowledge proofs outside of SGX. Uh, we do look at those two things as, as sort of parallel paths. Uh, they could potentially be combined, but uh, I'd say in the short term, uh, we're looking at uh, trusted execution environments as a um, a more performant way to do some of the the things that you would do with zero knowledge proofs. Uh, but but we are looking at the, those both in and outside of a trusted execution environment. Hey. Kelly, one more question about that about the client interface that you have. Um, are you um, are you generating signatures from the validators for commits and other things, or is it simply an API for notification? Um, yeah, so it's so it's predominantly uh, just a way to export um, both sort of state data as well as transaction data in a, in a streaming, uh, manner to clients and, and applications. Uh, okay. so there aren't any signatures on, on that piece. <clears throat> One of the other, uh, new features that, that isn't included in here, uh, is something that we call the batch injector. Uh, and that's actually a, a new feature where, um, each of the validators can, can insert a batch uh, right before the block is published that can be used for incentives and other things. Um, and so that does include uh, some some signatures there. Any other questions for Kelly? All right. Thanks, Kelly. Appreciate the update. Thank you. Uh, next up is Nikolai to give us an update on Aroha, and thanks, Todd, for the link. By the way, I added a link at the top-level project page. <laughs> this was one of those pages. The project updates page was one of those hidden, well-hidden pages, so it now has a link. Go ahead, Nikolai. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's Nikolai speaking. I will roughly follow the same structure for the project update as in the wiki. So the health, as as it said, um, is gradually becoming better as we're lowering our technical depth and increasing the number of features. However, um, currently the project has um, issues that we have delayed our alpha release 
as we haven't agreed on the contents for the alpha release uh, between the stakeholders. And also, um, we had problems with scientific research related to proper design of the shared objects library that the clients can reuse. And it took more time than we have expected. So, um, um, and also, as we have been uh, refactoring and restructuring the architecture starting in June, we have increased our technical depth since that date, and um, it greatly affected our velocity at the moment. So now uh, we are all focusing on quality uh, more than delivering features in order to eliminate the amount of depth that we have so that we can increase our velocity and proceed with the plan to deliver features. And um, um, overall, our activity includes um, the list that I have made uh, for in the weekend. So um, now Eroha has a role-based account, uh, role-based access control permission model, also supports grant command. We have uh, implemented effective cryptography. That means that we are validating payload signatures and signatures of blocks. We have also developed our own uh, consensus algorithm that is called yet another consensus. Um, we have a paradigm of having multiple components pluggable in the system. And that includes as well as consensus as, and also transport and cryptography and uh, storage. Yeah, that's called YAC. So um, when we've been trying to implement Sumeragi, we understood that if we want to implement some other uh, algorithms in the future or make some improvements, it's better to make it pluggable. So um, we've also been working on uh, improving the provisioning of the system. So we have implemented Ansible provisioning and the Swarm before Ansible. We greatly improved um, the environment um, availability so that now Eroha can, build, can be built on ARM architecture and macOS. Um, some of the contributors have also made um, uh, Python-based CLI, and we have made uh, uh, hours in C++. So overall, we're expanding the number of commands, and also we're, we're tightly working now uh, on the concept of smart contracts that are based on relational schema rather than on key value-based one. So we're having a, an intense research in that area, and uh, I hope we will uh, come up with a good definition for smart contracts in the nearest future. So as for current plans, we're working now on eliminating technical debt and uh, delivering uh, necess necessary functionality for the alpha release. And that includes uh, the update of uh, SDKs for our mobile platforms, as the ROHA is known to be a mobile first. So in order to be consistent with that, we, all, we need to deliver those before um, the alpha is released. Um, eight new maintainers were added to the team, uh, primarily located in Russia, in Nopolis, and uh, the list is in Markdown file. Our contributors are um, more diverse than they were before, so we are now in Japan and Russia. Uh, several Japanese companies are helping us with uh, uh, as, as use case partners, and this also includes National Bank, Bank of Cambodia, so they are also testing uh, EROH capabilities on site. And we had Ezekiel, who is a Hyperledger intern. He's been working actively of, on concept of anonymous transactions, and uh, right now he's working uh, in Saramitsu and helps us as a maintainer um, in terms of cryptography and the same concept of anonymous transactions. So I guess briefly that's it, and you have a lot of questions tonight. I'll be happy to answer you. So right now we're working also on the paper for yet another consensus. It took more time than expected. Actually, Fyodor is also here with us, and maybe he can um, explain the situation, but uh, we've been working actively on uh, our architecture and system properly, and that's why we didn't have <laughs> enough time to write a good explanatory paper on yet another consensus. 
So what, and we also have a good one on Sumiragi that Makoto San uh, already wrote. So are there any questions? Here I am yakking away um, and I'm on mute. <laughs> I was gonna, okay, so let me ask once again, because uh, I did this on mute. Uh, do we have any other questions for Nikolai? Uh, yeah, this is Dave Hughesby. Um, so, have you decided whether you're going to include a smart contract platform um, for your 1.0 release, or are you going to um, implement the API that some of the other projects are going to do so that you can just borrow the existing um, smart contract stuff? Um, so we're really thrilled now with the possibility to develop a new paradigm for smart contracts and we are looking forward to deliver this one in our 1.0 release so uh, that's the thing the thing is in development right now and we're really hoping to deliver this as a proof of concept in nearest future at least at the end of the year that but we don't know how to integrate the solution that we're having separately and the, our blockchain so it may take more time. Um, so uh, we didn't agree on that as a maintainers team yet. So I think uh, I'll answer you maybe um, maybe tomorrow because this thing is relatively new and we have been discussing it since the start of the week, actually. And <clears throat> were you are you still committed to implementing your own? smart contract language and execution virtual machine? So, um, yeah, we, we think that this is a good solution. However, uh, we have an, another opinion in the team, so it's kind of controversial. And uh, we, we had already talked to you about this, right? So we're, <laughs> we're going to... Yeah. Yes, so I was to, asking a probing question to for everybody else to hear the answer. <laughs> yeah, so this is kind of controversial, and we have uh, a lot of opinions on this. And uh, I think we need to come up with a good definition for our concept of smart contracts that are based on relational schema. And uh, maybe we can come up with a solution like a deterministic one, or I don't know. Um, fully Turing complete language that is um, well, the main specific one. So it's still in development. Hey, this is Brian Bellendorf. Um, what do you think the rest of the Hyperledger community could do to um, help get the word out about Aroha and bring additional developers to it? So for now, uh, it's there is one thrilling uh, project that we want to explore more and how it interoperates with Roja. Its name is Cello, and we really um, want to explore how we can use it for provisioning of the system. And <laughs> yeah, there is a draft of Yak paper, by the way, and it's really raw. So uh, Cello can help us with provisioning at the moment, and we need to explore how maybe Barrow can help us with smart contracts if we will fail with our concept of relational schema for smart contracts. I think the selling point is the um, fact that it is very strong in mobile, which are, is not the case, I believe, with some of the others. Or am I wrong? I mean, you, you guys had right from the beginning, 
focused on Android and uh, and uh, the other mobile operating systems. Yes, so situation right now is that we are working on the architecture and um, and um, uh, a good a good structure of components, but we have actually forgotten to uh, be mobile first, and that is what we're going to work at the nearest future to um, to become mobile first once again. So um, that's our current issue. I think I was stressing uh, Brian's point, which was basically uh, this would be a good hook for getting more people in, involved. Mm -hmm. if, if I recall correctly, that at one point, the, um, uh, the, the interface between the mobile clients and, and your nodes was the same as the Fabric REST API, um, which had been deprecated and with the move to gRPC. Um, is my memory correct? And, and is there, are, are you looking at moving to gRPC as well? Um, or is there some other inter interoperability plans with um, Fabric, if it's not already there? I'm not sure about Fabric, but our interoperability plans for now is to reuse our shared objects library than relying more on uh, REST API. REST API can be easily converted from protobuf endpoints, but we want to uh, guarantee that the objects that we form on client side, transactions, queries are um, are preserving the, um, the invariant about having a valid uh, object. And that's why we want to deliver this part of, of, of functionality in our shared objects library. And as for Fabric, uh, I guess we, I, I don't discuss, I haven't discussed this yet with our stakeholders, so um, I need to talk more to Makoto-san and maybe present this to technical steering committee at the next meeting. So I was just going to sort of weigh in on the, the point that, that Brian was also teasing at, and that was, you know, what can we do to, you know, attract more developers to the platform? Um, and obviously, you know, if the development is primarily in Asia and, 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 and in Russia time zones, that does present certain challenges, obviously. Um, but um, uh, again, I think you know, we should be looking at how can we, you know, raise awareness of what's going on a little bit more. Um, I don't know, Brian, if that's, you know, more blog posts or whatever, but do think we do need to do a little bit more to elevate Aroha um, visibility. So. Yeah, that was, that was my point. Yeah. Any other questions for Nikolai? Well, I, I mean, it's not a question, but just a continuing thought on that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I noticed that the, the Fabric and Sawtooth communities are, are very active in the mailing lists, right, and having discussions there about what's happening. Um, that could also help bring an, an alternative audience, right, uh, an audience that may be not on the time, same time zones, um, because if, if some of these design uh, decisions and, and conversations are happening out there, then other people can contribute to that and um, and have, you know, maybe get some interest from others to, to start contributing some of the, uh, around some of these ideas that the, the Aroha community has. I see, so maybe a good decision is to talk to Tracy more and develop a good strategy to communicate with a uh, community, like yeah. the policy I, for, for community management. We, we're definitely I'll, just, like I'll, a, I'll share a little bit about, you know, what I was encouraging the IBM team to do when they started down the path with Fabric. And that was, <clears throat> just 
just have the discussion in the mailing list or in Slack um, at the time. Um, even if nobody else is participating, the conversation is out there in the open and people can and eventually will join in and they did. Um, and so sometimes you just need to, um, to actually just go off and do it. And so if you're going to have a conversation about, you know, adding in a new feature or, you know, reducing the technical debt and figuring out what areas to focus on, have that conversation on the public mailing list, the, uh, you know, the Aroha mailing list. And, um, and, you know, that traffic will be noticed. People will start weighing in and, um, and or offering to help um, and or just providing their two cents. And eventually that leads to more people contributing. So that would be one way of starting down that path. So that's a good suggestion, Tracy. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I guess this is a good starting point. All right, thank you very much. I guess we can then, <clears throat> pardon me, I sneezed, um, to the um, Trading and Education Working Group um, Charter Proposal or Project Working Group, sorry, proposal. Um, so Todd, we have a link to that. And I think um, uh, I, I had sent a note, Brian and I had a, a bit of a chat after last week's call. Um, to get a sense of you know what I was looking for, and again, I was really, um, I, I was I was looking for something that just sort of said, hey, before we actually publish something as a quote unquote release, that will make sure that we've gone through the process of reaching out to the relevant SMEs. And so Brian added a uh, a paragraph, um, and uh, I think from my perspective, I think my concerns have been. Um, uh, resolved and um, I just I, I wanted to add uh, certainly from my perspective uh, Elaine, yeah, um that that from my perspective um, I think this is an important uh, area to invest in and certainly I plan on being uh, one of the maintainers I would encourage others to join as well especially if you're one of the people that's working on uh, as a maintainer or as a contributor to one of the other projects. I think this is also a good opportunity where we start, you know, getting more cross project interactions on a regular basis besides um, uh, just, uh, you know, weekly working group meetings. This is going to be much more interactive where we're con collaborating on content and so forth. So I, I do think this is an important thing that we should um, start, start moving on. So, um, I would just sort of open it up and say, are there any other concerns that had to be met that weren't covered? This is Brian, if I can just throw in. Um, uh, one thing that's missing from this that we should expect from any proposal is the um, list of initial maintainers. So if there's a sense um, that the charter is right, uh, then I'd like to, you know, um, with the TSC support for the charter, then go around to the different projects and, and individuals we know might be interested and say, okay, we're pretty much set. Do you want to join in as a maintainer? So I don't think it, this is ready for approval by the TSC today. My hope is that within the next, you know, two weeks, since there's no meeting next week, we can put together a list of uh, maintainers, including Chris, <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and then come back for a final approval of the working group. But, but just a clear, if there's a clear sign from the TSB that this is right, then that'll be helpful in that recruiting process. Um, do we want to do that, or we want to just sort of approve this and and then work on the maintainers? I, I would just, you know, just in the sake of, of not having to bring this back. Um, again. <laughs> well, I think that it is, it's more, uh, I think it is important to have maintainers before TSC approves it to make sure that we have a qu quality set of maintainers, really. Okay, fair enough, Marco. Um, do we actually, do we even have quorum, Todd? I, I forgot to ask. So as far as I can tell, we're one shy unless, uh, 
Greg or Jonathan have joined? I think Jonathan's at um, Epcon. Yeah, so I think we're we're one shy from quorum, regardless. All right. Actually, Brian's at DEFCON too. <laughs> What's Jonathan's excuse? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a big conference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, I guess then uh, we we have I guess agreement on the the charter itself, and um, I guess let's work on on getting some maintainers. Again, I would encourage um, some of the leads, especially from Aroha and Sawtooth and Burrow and Indy uh, sign on to this. So. And if, if you're interested and, in- And Fabric, doing... obviously, yeah. <laughs> I should, should have said that, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Chris. Um, yeah, if you're interested in you know being a maintainer, please let me know, and we'll make sure to get you um, added to the list of people who um, are interested in in this particular working group and uh, being a maintainer for the um, output of the working group. A so question I, I would have uh, to both Chris and Tracy and Brian is how much do we want also. Uh, record from the community to uh, uh, ensure that uh, we have uh, more engagement from the community and not only from the usual suspects. Definitely, Marta. I, I think that, you know, it doesn't have to be um, just people who are part of the projects. I think if there are people who training is their uh, lifeblood and that's kind of their passion, right? Um, then, then they should definitely feel free to, to reach out and say, you know, I'm interested in um, being in container of this group. I, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I, I, think, like that, I think that, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, Brian, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, uh, one thought we, I had was uh, we could post a, a, a slightly wider audience, you know, to the, general discussion mailing lists and a few other places to invite participation either as a maintainer or just you know when the when the working group has started uh, you know invite people to the list of that working group anyways it sounds like I think we've got consensus support um, not, not a vote but uh, we'll come back and either do an email vote or in the call in two weeks yeah that sounds good. All right. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Brian. Um, and I guess we have about 15 minutes left. Um, Dan, maybe you could update us on uh, Cicero. I don't know if we're going to get to a vote today because I know that we're um, uh, the, the last week there was a lot of questions and the paper wasn't published and people were interested in seeing some of the code and so forth. And I know that you've updated the proposal. But maybe you could review for everybody what you've um, done from an update perspective, and we can have a little bit of Q&A, and then maybe we can have a vote in a couple of weeks. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Todd. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Dan Salmon. Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, apologies for not making the call last week um, where Human presented the proposal, and, you know, all, all the comments that came back were, you know, very reasonable, and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, we were expecting them, frankly, you know, so... What I worked on this week is um, publishing the code. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, we moved the, the, the very draft kind of uh, reference implementation that we have um, out into a public Git repo. So you guys can take a look at it. And obviously, we'd love you to do that and to, to give us comments. Uh, and then we also published the draft of the what we're calling the Accord Protocol Template Specification. Um, um, so that is also available as a, as a public Google Doc that, um, that people can comment on. Um, so the, 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 the way that, um, you know, the, the, we hope this is going to work is that the, the Accord project is going to work on the specification side of things. Um, and that's going to be very heavily driven and led by the legal community. Um, so. You know, most of the work in the Accord project is going to be 
legal professionals looking at different types of legal contracts, um, coming up with domain models for those contracts, and deciding which clauses in those contracts are amenable to automation and execution, uh, and converting those contracts into you know what we call templates, you know executable uh, representations of those clauses. Um, and then the work that we would like to do in the Hyperledger community is to actually build the the reference implementation, if you will, of um, the stack that uh, you know captures those executable artifacts as a as an archive, as a zip, um, uh, and there's a description of that in the in the spec. And then the you know a JavaScript centric um, runtime environment, so that you can actually embed the execution of those templates into you know frankly whatever DLT um, comes next, or you know wh whichever of these DLTs people end up wanting to use. Um, you know our uh, you know, our, our, our plan is to uh, stay above the fray a little bit, if you like, in the DLT wars and try to be a good citizen and create a, an execution component um, for you know, executable smart legal contracts that you could embed into Composer, into Fabric, into Eroha, into Sawtooth, into Corda, into Enterprise Ethereum, uh, you know, essentially as a, as a reusable library. Um, so it, it, it's, I think it's a, it, it's a challenging proposal because it really does truly combine uh, the legal side of this problem, um, you know, engaging engaging with the law community through the Accord projects, and then engaging with the technical community uh, where we would like to drive that work through Hyperledger. Um, and we've, you know, we've taken the conscious decision to to be very open and kind of uh, start this process very early. Uh, you know, there's a lot more questions and answers right now, um, and the reason we did that was that you know we didn't want to go dark for six months or a year and then deliver something that was kind of fixed and, and very product centric. We wanted to engage the community and, and you know and build it in the open um, and and hopefully build a a very diverse um, set of contributors you know from across the kind of legal tech startup space. Um, but also involving you know legal law firms uh, and their innovation departments. Uh, I think there is also significant synergies with existing Hyperledger projects. Um, so we're reusing some technology that uh, from the Hyperledger Composer team, in particular the the modeling language that was developed for Composer. Uh, but we've also had very interesting discussions with the Indie team. Uh, because obviously if you're doing contracting you need to have a very strong notion of identity for the the contracting parties uh, and then when contracts are are terminated you know hopefully successfully um, those those contracts can can create additional claims right the you know uh, i have a contract with chris to deliver some widgets um, once the contract terminates um, you know chris can can create a claim that he successfully delivered the widgets on time um, so there's a, a you know a very sort of wide range of quite exciting possibilities that um, that would be enabled by you know collaboration with things like Indie. Uh, but uh, as I said, we're also extremely interested in uh, in you know, working with all of the DLT projects to create a component that's that's easily embeddable, uh, you know, and, and and to create that kind of legal smart contract fabric, um, no pun intended. <laughs> across all the DLTs. I'll shut up now and take questions. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Any questions, comments, suggestions for Dan? Hey, hey Dan, this has been um, so very interesting. Um, uh, you mentioned JavaScript and you mentioned uh, it's applicable to any DLT. Uh, you also mentioned that it would be a library. Um, would you would you uh, envision some kind of uh, runtime environment that somehow uh, got embedded into the DLT so that uh, this execution environment would be somehow part of the DLT and be protected, uh, you know, by by the DLT construct? 
Yes, um, what we're trying to do is architect it so that you can run it in a whole bunch of different form factors, um, you know, ranging from kind of on an IoT device through, you know, a cl SaaS cloud service, you know, a centralized trusted cloud service through, you know, a distributed execution on a, on a DLT. Um, so we, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that we can, we can pull that off. And using some of the newer, you know, JavaScript um, support across the platforms, uh, and then some of the WebAssembly stuff that's coming down the line, uh, I think that's feasible. But yeah, we, we, we you know, we, we're definitely interested in, you know, uh, you know, we, I've been following closely the Node.js support that's coming in Fabric. Um, so that, for example, would be a, a, you know, a perfect vehicle to embed this runtime inside Fabric. Okay, would you would you envision um, the smart contract here in terms of uh, uh, you know legals? Um, should it be from from the DLT point of view? Uh, should it be submit? Should it be submitted to the DLT as a transaction that containing the contract logic in it in some way uh, or it? would be a um, our bank install because we we you know in in, in fabric we, we we've been debating this right and uh, certainly we encounter use cases of both uh, you know some people want to uh, ship the code out as part of uh, a transaction but because of confidentiality and other things uh, people want to be able to uh, control these things by uh, direct deployment to uh, the members who are required to execute the smart contract, but not to general populations, for example. Yes, and, and um, you know, I'll, I'll level with you. I, I think, frankly, we don't we don't know the right answer yet, uh, and I suspect there are, there is no single right answer. Um, so. Uh, okay. We, we're going to try to support a variety of scenarios. Uh, there definitely are legitimate scenarios where people want to execute their contracts off chain. Uh, the data is coming from the chain into the contract, and then the side effects of executing the contract need to go back onto the chain. But the contract itself, um, you know, for, for privacy reasons, uh, probably needs to execute off chain. But, but there are also other use cases where um, it's probably fine and it's desirable to run the, the contract on chain itself. Right, um, okay, thank you. Uh, I, hey, yeah, well, Dan. I, I'm a pragmatist. <laughs> Sorry, um, just a couple of questions, this is Mick, um, just a couple of questions about kind of the, the current status of things and I, I made some comments on the proposal about um, you know, like the Accord project looks, at least the information we have there is really thin and you mentioned um, giving kind of an update. It, it, what what is the status of Accord, Cicero, and the rest of these right now? Um, are we, uh, are, are, is this a wrapper for sort of experimental code? Is it a transition of code that's kind of prototyped to something that we need to harden? Um, wh where, where are you at in that process? So it, I think Human is on, he's probably best placed to do the status on the, the Accord project, and then I can pick up the technical items. Human, are yeah, you there? Sure. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. This is Human. I hope you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Great. Yeah. The, the Accord project's uh, status is uh, great. We're mo we're moving along um, in terms of uh, forming partnerships and uh, adding memberships to uh, sort of generally and to the specific working groups. Uh, we recently, for example, just formed uh, partnerships with uh, the University College of London, uh, Center for Blockchain Technology, which itself is a, quite a vast resource of uh, both uh, technical and sort of business and general blockchain expertise. Uh, uh, similar with um, uh, Blockchain at Berkeley um, out there on the West Coast, we're doing a lot of great things um, from their side of things, uh, as well as we're, we're in pretty final stage discussions with uh, organizations such as IEEE, uh, the Trusted um, Internet of Things Alliance and so forth. So th that is really establishing 
the, the broad strategic vision in terms of what the specific use cases and types of contracts we are focusing on, as well as um, organizing uh, various attorneys in specific areas like supply chain and so forth. Um, we're also talking to groups at MIT. I just spoke there at a, a round table uh, a couple of weeks ago, or was it just last week, with their Center for Transportation and Logistics. So that's basically where the Accord project is going, is really building this uh, uh, knowledge base of legal expertise that will feed into uh, the Accord uh, pro protocol specification when it comes to uh, the templating, the grammar, uh, the data uh, structures that um, are more elaborated in the specification that was just released today. Yeah, thank you. So you can, if, you know, for the for the technologists, that's essentially the source of requirements, right? The most of the 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 legal requirements are going to come to the to the project through the the Accord project. Uh, that's, you know, it's 80, 90 percent a legal discussion. It's lawyers sitting around looking at supply chain contracts and deciding uh, what language can be standardized in a supply chain chain contract. What are the semantics of execution of a supply chain contract? What's the right data model for a supply chain contract, and then capturing that in an artifact that that is executable, frankly. Uh, and then on the hyperledger side, you know, we're gonna we're gonna supply the shovels, if you like, right? We're gonna we're gonna provide some uh, some SDKs and some implementations of those specifications, so that once those Accord project working groups capture the knowledge, um, we can actually deploy it into a DLT environment or a non-DLT environment, uh, you know, and they can start executing it and, and, and we rinse and re repeat effectively. So that, that you know, that, that's, the, that's the strategy. Does that help? Uh, and, you know, Sorry. It, it, <laughs> Sorry, I have two mute buttons I gotta go through. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, it, I mean, it, it, it. I will say it just it feels very early. Um, yeah, <laughs> hard. Thanks. Um, yeah, it just, sorry, it feels really early um, on this, and and I'm I'm still having kind of a hard time getting my head wrapped around um, what the coding part of this project is. I, it, at at times when I and by the way, I've I, you know we've we've looked at some of the contracting languages and some of the other things that have been done. Um, at different levels and formal verification and things, so I'm I'm at least a little bit familiar with with the kind of things that are happening there. But um, how do you uh, it, it, do you position this as kind of an orchestration as a validation? Um, would, and and I'm specifically talking about the technology side of things. I'm I, the other half of it. I kind of I kind of get. Um, <laughs> So probably that maybe the easiest thing for me to do is is to just quickly describe what the code does that we've open sourced because that's a very concrete thing you can you know it's not a vision statement right you can actually go look at the code and uh, you know you'll see what I'm talking about um, uh, so the code that we've open sourced right now it um, is sort of an it, it's a it's a very early draft kind of work in progress implementation of the Accord template specification. So it allows somebody to take a piece of legal text, uh, punch some holes in it uh, to parameterize it, um, and then the code that we've open sourced generates a grammar for that legal text, uh, quite a sophisticated grammar, that allows you to create instances of that template you know, as, as plain text. Uh, and then there is a, um, you know, a, a, a fairly simple Node.js based VM which can execute um, those clauses against input data and return results. Um, so there, there, you know, today with the open source code, you can create your, you can create a, you know, a smart clause um, from a a piece of legal text, parameterize it, and then execute it against input data and return output data. That's essentially what was open source so far. Thank you. And you know, the this is going to be a very you know, it's going to be an iterative process, obviously. But the, the that level of functionality allows the different 
vertical working groups within the Accord project to start capturing that that domain knowledge. And the domain knowledge comes in two main flavors. One is the the data models about a domain, and then one is the you know the legal language about a domain. And the the Accord template specification brings those two things together in a in a single artifact. And then it combines it with a you know some some business logic that that the engine can actually run. Um, are you going to try to make the execution environment um, have the same APIs that the other smart contract engines have, so that it can participate as a pluggable component in the Hyperledger community? I'd be very open to that. I'm, I'm not I'm not familiar with those APIs yet, but I will. I'll go do some homework and, and get up to speed. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know we have a bit of a challenge there because there isn't a comp sort of singular API to a smart contract. Maybe. Um, just... Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I was going to say there there is no consensus on that just yet. Pun intended. <laughs> yeah. um, also, uh, how uh, yeah, I'm not sure how I, ignorant. I, okay, I, I can ask a question on so email. I, yeah. Um, so we're, we're out of time, and uh, in respect for everybody's calendars, um, I think we'll end the call now. So those of you who want to read up a little bit more about Accord and so forth, I suggest we take this discussion to the mailing list since we aren't meeting next week. And, uh, and then we'll vote on it again on the 16th. So thanks again, Dan, <clears throat> and everybody for the conversation. And um, see many of you or some of you at the, the, uh, the summit in um, Singapore next week. Uh, and the rest of you will talk to you in a couple of weeks. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.